Welcome to Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or are with us this morning for the first time, we are glad you are here. I'm Reverend Sharon Wiley, Chalice's minister. Our worship musicians this morning are Justin Gray and our music director, Tim McKnight. Welcome to this online worship service. Welcome to those of you watching live using Zoom Sunday morning, and welcome to those of you who are watching the recording of this service later on Chalice's YouTube channel. For those of us using Zoom, please notice on your menu that there's a button that says CC Live Transcript. This is Zoom's cl closed captioning service, and you can click on it to uh, hide the subtitle or show the subtitle, turning it on or off. You're in control of that function on your screen. Also on your menu is the chat button. For those of us who like to use the chat box during the service, which you're welcome to do, please be sure that when you post that you've used that little blue drop down menu to select everyone. Uh, if you only chat with the host and panelists, <laughs> I am all of the hosts and the panelists, uh, and I may not see your message during the service. So let's all give ourselves a big hug of hello and welcome. If you share space with someone uh, with consent, maybe offer a hug to each other. Uh, it's easy to be in space together and to forget to reach out and, um, and greet and feel each other. Finally, I want to welcome those of you who are newcomers at Chalice this morning. Towards the end of the service, I'll put a link in the chat box for adding your name to our email list. Our weekly email is where we put all of our Zoom information and most of our groups and activities are still happening by Zoom. We have some meal uh, activities that are beginning to happen in person for people who feel safe to do so. Uh, but getting on the email list is how to make start to make more connections with our community. Also, once you're on our email list, you'll receive information about our monthly gathering for newcomers. Now, let's take a breath together. We begin our service by acknowledging that wherever each of us is watching, if we are on land that is now called the United States, then we are on land that has been stolen from indigenous peoples. Our congregational home in what is now called Escondido is on land that is part of the traditional territories of the 12 bands of the Kumeyaay Nation and the seven bands of the Payamkacham, also called the Luiseño. Land that is sacred to us now was stolen from people for whom that land was and is still sacred. In recognition that we are the beneficiaries of a history of colonialism, we have made financial donations in the past year to several local indigenous led organizations, California Indian Legal Services and indigenous centers at SDSU and at CSU San Marcos. It is our hope at Chalice to find our way to right relationship with local tribes. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. The flaming chalice was first used during World War II by the Unitarian Service Committee as a symbol of life-saving refuge for people fleeing persecution in Europe. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. It burned out before I got there. May our chalice flame burn brightly that all who are seeking may find us. Today is our second of 10 spotlights on black composers and musicians. Last month, we featured the composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Today, we shine our spotlight on the African-American composer, organist, pianist, and music educator, Florence B. Price. 
Florence was born in Little Rock, Arkansas on April 9th, 1887 to dentist James H. Smith and businesswoman and teacher Florence Gulliver Smith, who provided musical instruction for her daughter Florence. Florence's musical gifts were apparent very early in her life. She began performing at the age of four and published her first composition at age 11. After graduating as valedictorian of her high school class in 1902, Florence enrolled at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, one of the few conservatories at the time that admitted African-American students. By age 19, Florence had received two music degrees from the conservatory. At the urging of her mentor and conservatory teacher, George Whitefield Chadwick, Florence began to incorporate elements of African-American spirituals into her compositions, especially the rhythmic syncopation that characterizes many spirituals. Her melodies contained influences of both European romantic music and the blues. This blending of European and African musical traditions would come to define much of Florence Price's music. In her lifetime, Price composed more than 300 works, ranging from small teaching pieces for the piano to large-scale symphonies and concertos, instrumental chamber music, choral works, and art songs. After college, Florence returned to her home state of Arkansas, where she would spend the next two decades. She married lawyer Thomas Price, with whom she had two daughters. Her early adulthood was devoted largely to teaching and raising her family. The American South was firmly in the grip of the Jim Crow era. As racial tensions grew in Little Rock, resulting in a horrific lynching in 1927, the Price family decided to move to Chicago. There, Florence found a vibrant community of African-American musicians and composers. Price blossomed as a composer. Her first symphony in E minor won a composing prize and was later premiered by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1933 marking the first time that a major American orchestra played music by an African-American woman. Price's art songs and spiritual arrangements were frequently performed by well-known artists of the day. In 1939, the great contralto Marian Anderson featured Florence's spiritual arrangement, My Soul's Been Anchored, in her famous Easter Sunday performance on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. While Florence's career was surely limited by the discrimination she faced both as a woman and as a person of color, that discrimination continued after her untimely death in 1953, preventing much of her music from ever being heard for over half a century. But then in 2009, a twist. Vicki and Daryl Gatwood of St. Anne, Illinois, were preparing to renovate an abandoned house on the outskirts of town. It was there that they made a curious discovery. Piles of musical manuscripts, books, personal papers, and other documents. It turned out that this rundown house had once been the summer home of Florence Price. Inside was a treasure trove of over 30 boxes of music, dozens of compositions by Florence Price, which up to that point, historians had thought were lost forever. The discovery seemed to ignite a renewed interest in Price's music. In 2018, she was inducted into the Arkansas Women's Hall of Fame. In August 2020, the International Florence Price Festival held its inaugural gathering celebrating Price's music and legacy. Librarians and scholars continue to pour over those 30 boxes of musical gems. Clearly, Florence Price's story is far from over.
Everything is falling apart. Everything is possible. Everything is falling apart, which means that everything is possible. This is the time to dream. This is the time to be reminded of our highest aspirations. Out there is anxiety and fear and ugliness, people being mean to each other. May this be a time of refuge and sanctuary where we remind ourselves of the best we can be. As the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman wrote, in the quietness of this place, surrounded by the all-pervading presence of the holy, my heart whispers, keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve that in good times or in tempests, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. May this hour together nourish us in our moments of high resolve that we may be strengthened in that to which our lives are committed. Let us worship together. You're invited to join in singing. Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. If you'd like to share a joy or sorrow with the congregation this morning, now is the time for sharing in the chat box. These don't get spoken out loud. They don't become part of the recording uh, for YouTube. If you'd like to send me a confidential note about your joy or sorrow or to make a prayer request, please email me. I'll put my email address in the chat box.
I Am Every Good Thing, written by Derek Barnes and illustrated by Gordon C. James. I am a nonstop ball of energy, powerful and full of light. I am a go-getter, a difference maker, a leader. I am every good thing that makes the world go round. You know, like gravity, or the glow of moonbeams over a field of brand new snow. I am good to the core, like the center of a cinnamon roll. Yeah, that good. I am skateboard tricks, scraped knees and elbows. But you know what? I am right back on my feet again. I am one eye opened, one eye closed, peeking through a microscope, gazing through a telescope, checking out all the spaces around me and plotting out those far off places I have yet to go, but will. I am a gentleman and a scholar. I am kind and polite like, yes ma'am and yes sir, helping my grandmother cross the street and saying, bless you, when a stranger has to sneeze. I'm a cool breeze, a perfect paper airplane that glides for blocks, for miles, forever. I am a roaring flame of creativity. I'm a lightning round of questions and a star-filled sky of solutions. I'm an explorer, planting a flag on every square foot of this planet where I belong. I am a sponge, soaking up information, knowledge, and wisdom. I want it all, and I am all ears. I am Saturday mornings in the summertime. I am two bounces and a front flip off the diving board. I am hilarious. I am the life of the party. I am that smile forming on your face right now. I'm the boom bop, boom boom bop, when the bass line thumps and the kick drum jumps. I'm the perfect beat, the perfect rhyme, keeping everything on point and always on time. But you already knew that. I am a grand slam, bases fully loaded. I'm a nasty two-handed dunk, holding on to the rim just to remind you that I'm still the man. Believe that. I am the undisputed champion. 
I'm a highlight reel of magnificence. I am the celebration, the applause, and the standing ovation. I am victory. I am a brother, a son, a nephew, a favorite cousin, a grandson. I am a friend. I am real. I am tight hugs, a hand to hold, a shoulder to cry on, if you have to. I hope you never have to. I am here. Although I'm something like a superhero every now and then, I am afraid. I am not what they might call me, and I will not answer to any name that is not my own. I am what I say I am. I am that sound in the forest when the mighty tree falls. I am waves crashing gently on the shore. I am a force of nature, a miracle, a blessing. I am brave. I am hope. I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. Each year, I pick a topic for us to uh, study deeply over the course of the church year called our spirit study topic. The main expression of our spirit study is a series of 10 sermons, one per month beginning in September and going through June. During the course of our anti-racism work the past few years, we have heard again and again to center the voices and experiences of marginalized peoples and for white people to do less talking and more listening. And so I started to think about how great it would be for us to listen to some of our black Unitarian Universalist preachers, especially now that using video has opened us up to be able to hear from people who are outside our local area. So I've invited 10 UU preachers to preach for us over the course of 10 months, one service a month, and they are invited to preach on any topic of their choosing. Today is our second sermon in this series. This morning's preacher is the Reverend Margalee Belazare. She is the called and settled minister of the First Unitarian Church of Orlando, Florida. Please join me in opening our hearts to what she has to share this morning. You accepted, like a beast of burden, the whip of a stranger's curse and the mindless menace it holds, along with the scar it leaves behind as a definition you spend your life refuting, although that hateful word is only a slim line drawn on a shore and quickly dissolved in a sea world any moment when an equally mindless wave fundles it, like the accidental touch of a finger on a clarinet stop that the musician converts into silence in order to let the true note ring out loud. Toni Morrison. I don't know about you, but I now experience the parable of the Good Samaritan in a completely different way from before. You know, the story recounted by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, answering the question, who is your neighbor? Asked by someone who should have known this already, but was testing Jesus. It is the story of a traveler who was robbed and beaten half to death and left on the side of the road, maybe left there to die. A priest came upon this scene and crossed to the other side of the road and continued on his way. 
Then a Levite came along and did the same. Neither of them stopped to help this dying man. The understanding here is that those two people, the priest and the Levite, would have been natural neighbors to the traveler as they, like Jesus, our storyteller, were all Israelites. At some point, a Samaritan came along. Now, Samaritan, according to history, were, according to history, were quiet disliked by Israelites. So in this scenario, it would have been expected that he too would have crossed the road and not engage at all. Instead, this hated Samaritan not only stopped and promptly provided care, but he went on to take the stranger with him on his journey, paid for his stay at an inn while continuing to care for this man for two days, seemingly putting his own business on hold. And when this Samaritan needed to leave for a bit, he paid the innkeeper to take care of this stranger, promising additional payment if what he had given wasn't sufficient. Clearly, out of the three passers-by, the one who behaved in a neighborly fashion is the Samaritan. As we know, parables are meant to teach something. They're meant to be a moral or spiritual lesson in the Christian tradition. And the moral of this story, the moral of the Good Samaritan, or at least a couple of its lessons are that race and ethnicity should not dictate who we help in moments of crisis, that we need to do right by one another regardless of beliefs or background. I adhere to this holy idea and, and I generally felt a level of softness or softening up in me when I considered the phrase the Good Samaritan and what it implied. Like most things though, there is more to this story. It is my morning spiritual practice that I read a prayer three times with pauses in between each reading to reflect what rises to the surface for me. This is similar to a practice called Lexio Divina the reader reads something, pause to reflect and see if certain words, certain phrases pops up for them. And, and that is one of my spiritual practices. A while back, I was reflecting on a prayer on Jericho Road by Diane Rollert. At some point in my meditation, the good Samaritan kept coming up for me but not in that familiar, soothing way. I could feel a shift in me. I began to wonder why the parable called the Good Samaritan, why the parable is called the Good Samaritan when in its telling, Jesus did not qualify what type of a Samaritan this person was. And something that got lost in the story, as the story traveled and was retold is that Samaritans were an oppressed people. So this important element of the parable has taken a less and less central space to where it's not even considered anymore. When really, that's what made the parable significant. When we hear the good Samaritan parable in today's time, the story is usually modified where the people involved are on equal footing or people of similar social groups or simply didn't get, people who simply didn't get along. Furthermore, very few people of our time have ever heard of Samaritans outside of the context of the story. Samaritans have become, in a way, mascots, not unlike how we name sports teams after the indigenous people of this land. And we have singled out the good Samaritan, an exceptional Samaritan perhaps? Other oppressed people or those who have been regulated to the margins, 
are viewed and or treated similarly. Phrases such as the first, the only, you're different or commonplace for such identities. On the other hand, when a black person breaks the law, every single black person is deemed a criminal in the eyes of the oppressor, as this provides a justification for the continued oppressive treatment. There is a white acquaintance of mine who claims to be uncomfortable around black people because when she was in her 20s, she was robbed by a young black man who stole her purse. She's now in her late 60s and continues to feel or felt justified in judging all black people by this single act. The second time she mentioned this to me as if wanting me to validate this stance, I replied, how many acts of kindness have you benefited from black people since that one incident? And more importantly, how many times have you been hurt by a white person throughout your life? And how has that impacted how you engage white people? She responded, huh. To her, each instance of good heartedness from a black person was an outlier or done by a black person who was different, the good black person. I could not tell you how many times I've heard, you're different, or depending on how comfortable the person is in their opinion, they might add from other black people. I'm not alone in this. Many black folks have had to suffer such insults while at the same time be expected to receive them as compliments and be grateful to be deemed better than other black folks and therefore closer to white folks who are the standard. The idea that good could simply be one of the many manifestations of black people is not logical for my acquaintance and many others who nurture anti-black sentiments. It is not something that they readily make space for. I mean, how else can someone continue to mistreat a people without believing that they are deserving of such maltreatment? And the most insidious part of this is that it becomes the responsibility of the oppressed to prove that they are worthy of humane treatment. I believe that it is intentional that in, in the story that the Samaritan is the oppressed, that it is the Samaritan who is cast in the role of the helper. It is expected that downtrodden, the death that the downtrodden has to keep proving their worth. And it's a losing battle, right? Since each act of evil by one is attributed to the entire group, while acts of good are deemed atypical and done in spite of the person's social status. So oppressed people are vilified for anything wrong done by one, but do not get to be heroes when a member does something right. I hold my breath every time I watch the news or listen to it, and a crime is being reported until the race of the perpetrator is revealed because I know that if it's a black male, my nephew might suffer for that. It might have adverse consequences to my sweet, loving, and gentle Dimitri, a black man. I wonder for those of us here who identify as, who identify as white, if you give a second thought when a perpetrator is revealed to be white, if it makes an impression on you at all, and not that it should. At the same time, it is a privilege not to have to worry about such things. For black people, others insist on telling us our stories and telling us who we are. And it's never flattering. The stories told about us purport that we are no better than the beast and that we are inferior to other humans. It is told that we are barbaric. It is told that we are inept, that we are violent, that we are imbeciles, that we are aesthetically hideous. 
We are criminals. We are abhorrent. We are idiots, soulless, damned, and so on. Consequently, we are unworthy of love and compassion, undeserving of equitable treatment that we should perhaps hide away and not make waves. We have to be grateful for what we've been allowed to have, for we merit less that we should somehow be ashamed of who we are. Apologize for it. We are looked down upon for not having the resources we need when so much has been taken from us. We are judged harshly when we fail, yet it is presumed that we will fail. We are expected to do much with little or nothing and are called lazy when we don't succeed. We exist in a body that has to earn grace, which is freely offered to others. Those are the stories more often than not that are told about us. One of the most damaging effects of such stories is that the negative stereotypes can come to be internalized. Even worse, without realizing it, we preserve the very system that subjugates us by allowing ourselves to be seen through the lens of those who consider us inferior. So we spend our lives aspiring to be like the oppressor while continuously devaluing ourselves. As Toni Morrison noted from the reading earlier, we sometimes accept like a beast of burden, the whip of a stranger's curse and the mindless menace it holds along with the scar it leaves. Yeah, but who we are in fact is glorious and mediocre. We are brave and we are cowardly. We are capable of tremendous love and extreme acts of violence. We are brilliant and we are foolish. We are humble and arrogant. We are loving and compassionate yet hateful and cruel. We are law abiding and we break the law. We are woke and we are dead asleep, generous and avarice. We are sages and can be imp imprudent. We are divine creatures and we don't believe in God. We are perfect and flawed. We are strong and we are fragile. And we are a resilient people who have endured for better and for worse, so much atrocity, so much pain, so much suffering. We have been disregarded, trampled on and lied on, and yet we have survived and even thrived. We are all those things and more. Accordingly, we are worthy of love and compassion, deserving of just treatment, to be celebrated and offered grace, earned or unearned, to be seen fully. I mentioned to you how a shift happened for me as I reflected on the prayer on Jericho Road. Prior to that shift, I was certainly guilty of not seeing the Good Samaritan as a person connected to a people, a people with a history who also deserve to be seen fully, not in a one-dimensional way or as a mascot. I set out to learn more about Samaritans outside of the context of a parable from the Bible. I know that I'm limited in this endeavor by not being in relationship with anyone from Samaria. But make no mistake, I am well aware that this learning is for my own growth. It doesn't change anything about who Samaritans are or will continue to be. Their humanness is not contingent on what I know about them or me bestowing that on them. It is their birthright 
as it is the birthright of any people I am sharing this planet with as it is for the people with whom I share a history by virtue of being members of the same race. I wonder if there are stories of people you might have heard before that might need a second look. I invite you to look at such stories with fresh eyes and renewed curiosity. I encourage you to question what might have been left out and for whose benefit is the story being told? The Good Samaritan parable was certainly not for the benefit of any Samaritan, nor are the stories told about black people for our benefit. I still subscribe to the teachings of that parable. It is right that race and ethnicity should not dictate who we help in moment of crisis as everyone is our neighbor. That we need to do right by one another, regardless of beliefs or background. However, the most neighborly thing we can do for one another is to afford them their whole story and their full humanity. I'm not a stranger to the dark Hide away, they say Cause we don't want your broken parts Learn to be ashamed of all my scars Run away, they say No one will love you as you are But won't let them break me down to dust I know that there's a place for us For we are glory When the sharpest words want to cut me down When the sound of life can drown them out I am brave, I am bruised I am who I'm meant to be This is me Look out, cause here I come And I'm marching on to the beat I drum I'm not scared to be seen Gonna 
send a flood, gonna drown them out. I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, cause here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. That sermon was so good, I'm crying. <laughs> the Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Joseph Goldstein has said, it's important to understand that generosity is a practice. It's not just a single event. It's a quality in our hearts and minds that we can develop and cultivate. Please text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to enter your credit card information. And if you've entered that information previously when you've donated, you won't need to enter it again. If your Sunday donation is part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate the word pledge after the dollar amount. And also know you can make a text donation anytime. It doesn't need to be just during the worship hour. So the phone number will be on screen in a moment and I'll also put it in the chat box. Please give generously. Please join me in dedicating our offering with words of affirmation. As Unitarian Universalists, we gather to affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning.
Closing words come from the Reverend John Alou Johnstone. We shall overcome. When we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people, we shall overcome hatred and prejudice and oppression. When we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance, we shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome. Amen. You're invited to close our time together by seeing the well. Uh, reminder, if you're new to the congregation, I'll be putting a link in the chat box to uh, add your name to our email list. And everyone is invited to coffee hour uh, just after this service. <laughs>